All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about buying and selling a manufactured home in a park or buying the whole park. Uh, my name is Joe Cizek. I'm a housing attorney here at the Virginia Poverty Law Center. I've worked in this uh, area for uh, several several years now since becoming a lawyer, um, advocating for uh, communities uh, that are uh, manufactured home parks and uh, empowering residents of those communities. I'm joined today by uh, my colleague and friend, Phil Story, who is the Eviction Legal Helpline Director. Phil, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm a, um, I've been a legal aid lawyer for um, 12 years and uh, worked with the Legal Aid Justice Center for nine and have been with um, VPLC for the last three and a half. Um, have worked with mobile home park communities for the last dozen years um, uh, in some parks in, in various parts of the state. Um, but uh, but anyway, happy to be here and and um, and kind of uh, watch Joe do his thing, and because um, I'll be doing it in Spanish tomorrow night. But um, anyway, it's a it's a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Well, glad to have you, Phil, and uh, glad the rest of you can join us here today. And those watching this recorded later, glad you have this information. All right, so. <clears throat> Uh, what we're going to be talking about today uh, is going to be broken up into uh, three general parts. Uh, first, buying and selling a home in the park. Uh, also, uh, just a brief note on terminology. Uh, I'm probably going to be a little inconsistent in the terms I use for this. Uh, the law calls these manufactured homes. Uh, folks in the communities will call them mobile homes or sometimes trailers. Uh, I typically say mobile homes, um, but we'll probably be switching throughout. So Apologies in advance if that gets a little disorienting. Um, but anyway, so buying and selling a mobile home in a park um, and the illegal uh, or legal requirements for doing so, uh, how some tenants uh, can possibly get scammed, uh, and then how tenants ought to uh, protect their rights when selling or buying a home in a park. Uh, then we're gonna discuss um, park sales. Um, when a whole community goes up for sale, uh, tenants have an opportunity to purchase the park themselves um, or cooperate with uh, nonprofits who'd be interested in preserving the park, or otherwise just try and make sure that that housing stays available. Uh, so we're gonna be discussing that and the legal requirements and rights uh, that are implicated when a park is being sold. And then finally, uh, we're going to move on to some questions and answers. <clears throat> so first off, um, buying and selling a home in a park. Um, in a mobile home park, as uh, many of you are probably familiar, there's, uh, the tenant of the land, uh, it can be a homeowner. You can own your home and rent the land uh, in a lot lease. Uh, when you're selling one of these homes, uh, you have the seller of the home uh, who is uh, renting the land from the landlord and the buyer of the home who will need to be renting the land from the landlord. Uh, so obviously there's um, a little bit of back and forth between all parties here. Uh, there's going to be a sales contract between the seller and the buyer, um, but then the buyer must uh, also apply for uh, a lease uh, with the landlord. The seller must give the landlord notice of that prospective sale uh, so that the landlord is put on notice that, hey, this buyer uh, may be living in your community soon. <clears throat> if the home is going to stay in the park, um, which is, you know, the typical typical process. Um, you could sell a home uh, to be, um, you know, picked up and, and, and moved out of there uh, to another park, although that is significantly more rare. So we're going to focus on uh, uh, these mobile homes that, that remain in the community. Um, there are some legal requirements about that. For the seller, uh, you're required to have the DMV title in your name. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, you have to give notice to the landlord uh, with the name of the prospective buyer. Um, and then uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, sorry, I think that's a, a, a typo on there. But um, it was uh, just ill considered. You have to give the notice to the landlord before you actually sell the home. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, I see. Um, yes, uh, that is that is absolutely true. Um, the buyer uh, must apply for that lot lease, as I mentioned. 
Uh, and the landlord must fairly evaluate the buyer's lot lease application. They're not allowed to unreasonably refuse the lot lease. They can't say, well, I just don't feel like renting a lease to this person who you're trying to sell the home to, therefore I'm going to torpedo that effort. That would be unreasonable. They must have some sort of legitimate reason uh, to deny the, the, uh, the lot lease application that is uh, part of this sale process. Um, there are some illegal policies that we've seen landlords impose. Certainly, um, uh, before I go any further, I just wanna point out, certainly there are uh, landowners, landlords of mobile home parks that uh, do everything the right way. And uh, it's great uh, if you have one of those landlords. Um, however, uh, in our experience as legal aid attorneys, unfortunately, we're exposed uh, to some of the uh, the landlords who are are not doing everything above board. Uh, and so we've seen some illegal policies that landlords will impose uh, surrounding um, a home sale in, in their community. And we just wanna put you all on notice to look out for some of these things. Uh, one of those would be a restriction on for sale signs. Um, that kind of goes with this next one, which is a requirement that the landlord uh, handle the advertising and sale of the home. Uh, you're allowed to, you know, post it on Craigslist or, you know, in your church group or anything like that. You don't have to go through the landlord. Certainly, you have to have the tenant apply for a lease and you have to let the landlord know that you're, uh, that you intend to sell the home to that tenant. But that doesn't mean that the landlord gets to be the gatekeeper of uh, to whom and how you sell the home. Um, furthermore, uh, if the uh, homeowner wants, they can rent out rooms in their home. There can be no unreasonable restrictions on subleasing uh, in a mobile home park. Um, so if the landowner was to have a limitation that homeowners may not rent out their homes or rooms, just blanket statement, uh, that would be an illegal uh, policy. Um, another one would be if the homeowners cannot uh, sell homes to keep, uh, to someone to keep it in the park, um, you know, saying that the, the homes must be removed from the park. Um, that, that would be another illegal, po uh, illegal policy. Uh, unfairly rejecting a lease application if someone wants to buy a home in the park. Like I said, uh, they can only do that if they have a good legitimate reason. Uh, for example, if the, um, you know, the person who is the incoming uh, tenant uh, has atrocious rental history um, that would, uh, you know, lead the landowner to believe that they couldn't afford the lot rent, which would have to be pretty bad because lot rent is usually pretty cheap, but it could happen that the landlord denies a leasing application legitimately. Um, they can't do that uh, without fair reason. Um, finally, uh, you know, that homeowners must pay their accounts up to date before they can sell their homes. Um, the, uh, the landlord, again, cannot uh, put unreasonable restrictions on these sales. Uh, the landlord cannot interject or cannot inject themselves into this sale and say, well, I get paid first. Um, One thing, um, Joe, that I'll just add that we've seen before too, is some landlords will say, okay, you need to have, you need to let me inspect your property before you sell it. And we had one park where the landlord would say, okay, you got to, you got to, um, switch out these appliances, or you've got to paint your home this different color and things like that. That's, uh, that's not reasonable. No, that's not. And, and your home is your castle. When you own your home in a mobile home park and the landlord uh, wants to go poking around inside of it, that should immediately raise your eyebrows. And if you're a low-income individual who has access to uh, assistance from legal aid, probably a good time to reach out to them to check in and see if that is, uh, if, if that's a, a, a good uh, policy that your landlord has. Uh, chances are it's not. <clears throat> Even if you've been evicted. Um, so uh, if the landlord takes you to court and sues to evict you, um, it's possible that uh, you can keep the home on the land uh, while you try and figure out what you're gonna do, whether you rent it out or sell it uh, in that amount of time, which, which only makes sense. You can't just pack up and leave with your home the same way that you could in an apartment. So after the eviction has taken place, uh, you're allowed to uh, keep it there contingent on uh, being current on rent. 
Um, if your rent is behind, you're gonna need to pay that uh, back to get up uh, current on rent. Um, and then as rent comes due, you need to continue to pay that rent. That can be a little difficult for folks sometimes uh, because you know if you've been evicted, you're probably living somewhere else now and paying for that plot of land or uh, apartment or what have you. Um, so it can be hard, but it is necessary uh, to pay the lot rent uh, in order to, to preserve this right to sell or lease your home uh, during the 90 day period following a court judgment. Uh, that would be a judgment for possession as part of an unlawful detainer case, which we all colloquially refer to as an eviction. Um, and, uh, you know, that being said, your landlord could not remove the home from the park uh, until after uh, 90 days has passed. Um, it, uh, it only stands to reason that the uh, landlord must give you reasonable access to the home and the lot so that you can show and sell the home. Uh, the, the contours of that are a little hard to map out, but um, if the landlord is preventing you from doing what's necessary to sell the home, then they are not substantially uh, keeping up their side of uh, this legal requirement. Um, again, uh, not all landlords are bad. Not all landlords are, are looking to, to get one over on their tenants um, in, in, uh, in mobile home parks. Uh, however, it is possible for uh, landlords to uh, scam uh, some of their tenants. And unfortunately, we've heard uh, numerous stories from different parts across the state where this sort of a scheme happens. Uh, all right, so, you know, uh, these steps here, let's say uh, you're a tenant in a mobile home park, a homeowning tenant, that is, you're renting the lot, but you own your home and you're looking to sell the home. You need to move. Your home is probably worth about $25,000. You've looked at some other homes that have sold recently, maybe in your neighborhood, and it looks like you could, you should be able to get about $25,000 for this. Uh, so as we discussed earlier, you tell the landlord, you know, hello, Mr. Landlord, I'm planning on selling this home. Um, landlord says, you know, well, I'll buy that home off of you for 15000 That seems a little low. Uh, you, you'd rather try and sell it yourself, thanks. Uh, and so you go on and you find uh, an interested buyer in your church group and, and they, they look at it and they say, hey, yeah, you know, that is worth 25000 and that sounds like a good deal to me. Uh, I, I would like to buy that from you. So the buyer um, applies for a lot lease uh, so that they can purchase the home and move in with the uh, move in uh, with the landlord's permission. Um, the buyer goes to the landlord and, and says, "Hey, I'm, I'm moving in." They say, "Oh, wait, you know which lot?" And you say, "Oh, I'm, I'm buying the home off of uh, you know this tenant." And the landlord, um, you know, unfairly denies the application or. A little bit more insidious. Oh, uh, you know that's a nice house and all, but you know it's really overpriced at twenty five thousand. You know we have one over here for twenty thousand that uh, we think would be a much better uh, deal for you, and, and steers the tenant away from uh, purchasing that home. That might happen more than once. Um, the homeowner can get desperate now. Um, they keep lining up offers, and then the purchaser just keeps dropping out. They're not sure why, or maybe. The landlord is telling all of these tenants that <clears throat> due to undisclosed reasons, they are not allowed to rent in that neighborhood uh, or in that community rather. Um, homeowner can get desperate. He can't find a buyer anyways. Coming down to the wire, he says, you know what landlord, I'm gonna take you up on that offer for, for 15,000. Uh, I couldn't find anyone better. And uh, now the landlord has uh, strong armed their way into this transaction and, and getting a home uh, that they can turn around and also sell, uh, undercut other people in the community who are trying to sell their homes. It can be a, a nasty little cycle um, that leads to, uh, you know, ex exploitation of, of this, uh, what should be uh, an open market for the homeowner to, to sell. Um, it, it's some, some undue influence from the landlord in those situations. We've seen this in, in a couple different parts of the state. Um, it's, it's a real shame when it happens. Um, so we, we want folks to be ready for it. So, uh, you know, with that in mind, um, you know, we want, uh, we want all y'all to uh, protect your rights when selling. Um, first of all, make sure to tell the landlord early when you're planning to sell. Um, keep, a keep written records of your advertising the home for sale and a list of names and contact info for the people interested in buying your home. 
Uh, and then when you reach an agreement with a prospective buyer, before you sell, give the landlord their name. Offer to pay the prospective buyer's lot lease application fee. That's a, a good, uh, a, a good uh, perk there. Talk to the prospective buyer after they meet with the landlord. Uh, ask how it went and make sure to take some, uh, some notes around that same time while you're, um, uh, while you're, you're doing that, some, some record of, of how these conversations are going. Um, if the prospective buyer submitted an application, talk with them after they get their results. Try and figure out, okay, you know, did they just decide they weren't interested when you didn't hear from them again? Or were they turned away by the landlord? Or were they redirected by the landlord in, a, uh, in an unfair manner? Um, and uh, you know, most importantly, keep track of everything in writing. Uh, these cases can be a little difficult to try and tease apart after the fact. Um, but it's only going to help you if you keep track of all of these things. Uh, and you don't need to think your landlord is looking to get one over on you to do your own due diligence and protect yourself. Nothing wrong with being careful. Um, make sure to just uh, you know, keep track of, of all of this process so that it's not possible for your landlord to take advantage of you. Protect both of you from that situation. Uh, if you're looking to buy the home, though, uh, here are some, uh, some ways that you might uh, do well to protect your rights. Um, ask if the landlord knows the seller is trying to sell the house. Uh, make sure that the seller has a DMV title in their name. Um, this issue of DMV title can be a tricky one. Uh, some older homes uh, may have had the chain of title broken. Um, that can happen in a number of different ways, um, but it can, uh, it can leave you in a situation where you've purchased a home and have no real uh, legal record of, of ownership, which can really come back to bite you in the butt and make it a lot harder to, to sell that home or to get uh, services to help fix up that home, et cetera. Um, okay, so going back, uh, apply and get approved for a lot lease from the park landlord uh, before uh, you sign a purchase contract. Uh, get the DMV title signed over to you when you buy the home. That's a, a real simple matter. Uh, if the seller is, is unwilling to do so, that should be quite suspicious because it's, it's not that hard to sign over one of these titles. Um, and then after that, uh, go to the DMV and get the title issued in your name after you've purchased it. Um, if anything seems off, seems a little suspicious, um, doesn't hurt to call your local legal aid for advice and see if they're able to answer any of your questions. Uh, that's what they're there for a lot of the time. You may or may not be able to uh, get assistance. There is a lot of demand for uh, legal services, but um, you know it's it's worth reaching out and trying to get some help uh, whenever you're in one of these situations and you have some real concerns. Uh, Phil, did you want to add anything before we move on to buying the, the part? No, just that um, I put a link in the chat to our little toolkit that we have put together that is basically it's forms that you can use when you're um, when you're trying to sell your home to keep track of all that information that we've mentioned. It's got some of the um, some of the other information that we talked about as well, like um, typical things that sometimes bad landlords will do to try and restrict your rights to sell your home and stuff like that. But it's got um, it's got forms in there that you can use to keep track of all of this information, which Hopefully you won't have to use, but if your landlord does uh, illegally interfere with your rights to sell the home, you can use that information to bring a case against them and, and get compensated for that. Right. Um, and that is a very helpful little kit. Um, it should make this whole process easier. It may seem intimidating hearing all these things you have to keep track of and, you know, uh, all these people you have to reach out to. It should be a little easier when you have uh, this kit to help make sense of all of that and, and have a good place to write it all down. Uh, reach out to uh, Phil or I if, if you ever have, have any questions about uh, that kit and how to use it. We're going to have our info at the end of this uh, presentation. All right. Um, so uh, that's, uh, you know, what we had to say about selling the uh, home within the park. Um, we wanted to talk as well, though, about uh, buying the park itself, buying the whole park. Um, this is something that we don't have in Virginia yet. We don't have community-owned um, 
or sorry, resident owned communities as they're often referred to in Virginia yet. Uh, it is an excellent um, model for uh, mobile home parks uh, and one that uh, I suspect will be getting in Virginia very soon. Uh, it simply is, uh, is not here yet. It's been gaining in popularity across the country um, as a solution uh, to these problems that I'm about to discuss. Uh, so resident ownership, what is a, a resident owned park or community owned park or however you wanna say it? Um, it is a resident co-op or other nonprofit, uh, a, a legal entity uh, that owns the park. But fundamentally what it means is that you own your home individually, just like you, knew, you do now, and you continue to pay lot rent, but you pay lot rent towards your own land. You own the land together with your neighbors uh, as, a, uh, as a cooperative or as some sort of uh, nonprofit form um, that uh, basically allows you to reinvest in your community. Um, right now, you're paying lot rent, and it goes to uh, the landowner, uh, the landowner uses those funds to uh, provide services for the park, hopefully uh, keep the park in a nice condition uh, to service the mortgage on the land or, you know, any sort of other loans or financing that is needed for the land. And then whatever's left over is their profit. That's what they're earning uh, for providing this service and for providing the land. Um, all the better if that extra money goes back into the community. Um, it can allow the community to control monthly lot rent. I mean, why would you need to raise the, the lot rent uh, beyond what is necessary if you're the one who is gonna be the one paying it? Um, the community uh, can decide what repairs and improvements they want for themselves. Um, you know, the lot rent should be earning a little bit more than uh, just the bare minimum. Uh, perhaps that can be used to uh, fix up a vacant lot into a park for the residents' uh, children, uh, or perhaps uh, it's time for repaving the roads. Um, wouldn't it be better if you could just vote on that with your neighbors and uh, hold a community meeting and decide that that's how you want to spend the money rather than asking a landlord who you know doesn't really have that strong of, a, of an incentive to do so. Um, furthermore, if, if you are uh, unfortunate enough to have a, a bad landlord, uh, in a mobile home park, this would be a, a pretty good solution to that. Can't get a much better landlord than yourself. Uh, it protects you against unfair evictions or bad park rules. Um, I've been to some communities that have uh, lot leases that are about 30 pages, and then there's additional rules on top of that. Uh, some of that is helpful. You know, you don't need people blaring music at two in the morning, and so there should be a rule against it. But some of that is, uh, you know, is, is, is a bit of an overreach. And if you and your neighbors were able to come together and decide for yourselves what you wanted the rules to be, those are probably going to be rules that, uh, you know, you respect more and that, uh, you know, if you don't like, you can work on changing. You don't have to just accept what you're given. Um, and then last, uh, you know, it creates a strong sense of community. Uh, this photo I used here uh, is from uh, this Oak Hill uh, Residents Association. They purchased their mobile home park through a, uh, an organization called Rock USA. that's R-O-C-USA. I'm gonna have that, some of their info later on. Uh, that's an organization that helps provide the financing for these sorts of arrangements. Uh, folks in the Oak Hill community uh, banded together when they heard that their park was gonna get sold to an investor. They were worried that the investor might close the park. They were worried that if the investor didn't close the park that the uh, lot rents might skyrocket. Um, and so they, they came together, they formed a resident association, uh, they got with Rock USA, and they purchased the park, and now they own it as a group. Uh, that's up in Massachusetts, but uh, there are similar stories all across the country. Um, I think that uh, resident-owned communities are really going to be the thing that um, make uh, mobile home parks, you know, the premier form of affordable housing in Virginia. It's going to be uh, uh, a great uh, opportunity for the folks who live in those communities to, uh, you know, captain their own ship, um, but, you know, not break the bank doing so. Um, <clears throat> so speaking of, uh, the park's being sold. Um, you've got reason to believe your landlord might sell the park. You're worried about that. You don't know what that means 
Um, what are we what are we looking out for here? What are the, what are the concerns if a mobile home park is sold? Um, and here's a couple different ways that might rear its head. Uh, new landlord issues. Uh, so the incoming landlord uh, may uh, raise lot rent. Unfortunately, we've seen a trend uh, across the country and in here in Virginia of investors purchasing these parks uh, with the uh, sole intention of uh, squeezing them for all the money they can get. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a legitimate business strategy, but it's not good for the folks who live there. Um, and, uh, you know, if you own your home and it's uh, too expensive to move, or maybe the home wouldn't really survive the move very well, uh, you kind of have to put up with these rent hikes. Um, so that can be a real concern when a new landlord is coming in. Um, similarly, uh, the new landlord uh, might come in and offer lease terms that are much worse than what you previously had. Perhaps there's going to be really bad rules that uh, you know are are terrible for your children, such as you know no playing at all uh, in other people's lots. We've seen uh, things like that. We've seen um, you know a, a rule where no child under the age of 18 can ever be left alone in the home. I mean, a 17 year old can't just come home after school and hang out till mom gets home. That just doesn't make sense. Uh, a, a new landlord could spell uh, some serious issues in uh, a community. Uh, more so than that, though, there's a threat of park closure. Uh, some of these mobile home parks, if they're not, uh, you know, charging uh, an arm and a leg for the lot rent, it's possible that they could uh, be redeveloped into something that makes the landowner more money. Uh, that might be other forms of housing. That might be a totally new type of development. Uh, obviously, this is more of a risk in some areas than others across the state, um, but it's, it's a real serious problem. If, you, uh, if your park is closing um, and you, I mean, that's, that's bad regardless. You're going to have to try and move that home. Um, you could end up uh, you know, not being able to move the home and, and paying for the price of it getting ripped off the lot. It can be really bad. Um, so that, that's very concerning. Um, but it also means opportunity, right? Um, like I was talking about, we can have uh, folks form an association, meet with your neighbors, talk with your neighbors, figure out, you know, what are we going to do to preserve our park? What are we going to do? Who are we going to talk to? You know, what am I going to have to say and do to make it the case that this park doesn't go away? It, you know, it might be your community, your home, your friends, family, neighbors, um, probably worth protecting. Um, so it's an opportunity to give input at uh, local government meetings, um, tell them that you don't want the land use to change if that's what's gonna need to happen. Uh, and fundamentally, there may be folks who can help you purchase that park yourself, keep it open as a mobile home park and make it better than it's ever been. You have some legal rights during these park sales. Uh, when a park is sold, a mobile home park is sold, the purchaser steps into the shoes of the seller. Um, so if you are six months into a 12 month lease and, uh, the landlord sells the park, um, that, uh, that lease is, is good for another six months. Uh, the landlord doesn't get to just say, Hey, I'm a new guy. You got to sign a new lease with me. Um, the, uh, current lease has to be honored. Um, Virginia law requires annual leases be offered to lot tenants that renew for additional year at the end of its uh, lease term. So that means that most of the time when a uh, landlord purchases a park, they can't just come in and, and change all the rules all at once or all the leases all at once. Um, rather, the, uh, the landlord has to be respectful of the current lease terms that are, that are in place. Um, that, however, it is the case that the landlord can change park rules with mere notice, uh, just as you're, you know, if the landlord doesn't change, the current landlord can decide, okay, well, you know, there have been a lot of, uh, you know, folks driving too quickly, I'm going to put a speed limit in this park, and they can just give you notice and that becomes effective. That, that's the case regardless. Um, uh, and then really the most important rights, I think, around uh, these park sales uh, come up in the forms of the different notices that are required to be sent to residents. Uh, residents might get a notice saying your park is being sold and don't really know what it means. So uh, we're hoping to break that down for you so you can really 
you know, know what type of notice it is you have and, and what you're looking at and, and what that means for you. What should you do? Uh, so these are the four types of notices uh, that you might get in a mobile home park uh, if the landlord is looking uh, to sell or redevelop it or anything like that. These are these are the main um, you know uh, notices that that deal with that sort of uh, situation. Uh, the first is uh, what I'm calling a listing notice. Uh, when the landlord wants to advertise the park for sale, that landlord is interested on, uh, in, in selling the park and want to have folks start putting in offers, um, they have to give a notice to all the residents and the state at least 90 days before the park is sold. Um, that notice uh, is you know, the first thing most folks are going to hear about uh, when the park is going to sell. Uh, that 90 days is your time to... Um, you know, step up and uh, try to figure out what the situation is then try and figure out what you're going to do about it. But I'll talk about that more in a moment. Uh, the second type of notice is uh, what I'm calling an offer acceptance notice. Um, when the owner receives an offer from a buyer uh, and they want to accept that offer, uh, the owner must give a notice to all residents and the state, again, uh, at least 60 days before the park is sold. Um, there's also a change of owner notice. Um, so this just has to do with when you get a new landlord, like I said, the new landlord stepped into the shoes of the old. Uh, they're required to let you know about that though. Um, it doesn't really change that much, except you need to know, you know, if your home is on fire, you're gonna call the uh, fire department certainly, but you need to let your landlord know as well. Uh, you know, who do you call in, in an emergency? Um, you also need to know how you're paying your rent. Uh, the landlord uh, is going to be giving you a change of owner notice for that. Um, and they do that at the time of uh, the sale and the transfer. Um, finally, uh, if the park is getting closed for a change of use, uh, they want to terminate all the leases uh, because this is no longer going to be a mobile home park. It is uh, you know, getting closed completely. Um, they can do so, uh, so long as they give everybody at least 180 days notice before the park closes. Um, so those are the main types of uh, notices. I wanted to give a little bit more of information though about you know, what should you do if you get one of these notices. So first of all, that listing notice saying, hey, uh, me, the landlord and landowner wants to sell this park. Uh, I'm gonna start advertising and getting a broker to uh, put together some deals for me. Uh, I'm giving everyone 90 days. Uh, at that point, you wanna talk with your neighbors about what it is you want for your community. Is this a close knit community that uh, you know, deserves being preserved or uh, are y'all willing to go your, your separate ways or deal with you know, whatever may come? Um, you're, you're gonna wanna talk to your local government about uh, you know, what can a buyer do based on the current zoning? Um, there's uh, you know, different offices depending on the county that you're in. Um, but, uh, you know, it, um, uh, someone in your, your, your local municipal government should be able to answer some questions for you about, you know, is your community zoned to allow it to be something else? Can a purchaser come in and turn this into a strip mall without any input from the local government? Uh, or will they need permission from the government to change how this land is used? Um, if that's the case, um, you may want to tell the local government about why you want this park to stay open as a park. Um, also, uh, this would be a good time to consider whether you want uh, someone to help you purchase this park, um, whether someone like Rock USA or another organization can help you put together an offer uh, to make this a resident-owned community here in Virginia. Um, the offer acceptance notice, this is similar to the last one, except it says, hey, I've found a buyer now and you know, he's gonna be purchasing this park for such and such amount of money. Again, talk with your neighbors, talk with your local government, make sure you understand what's going on and, and you know, what the situation is. Uh, now that you know a little bit more about the possible purchase, you may be able to negotiate for a purchase price. Um, this might be your last chance to put in an offer on the park. Um, if the sale goes through, the new owner might not be willing to sell right away. Uh, so, you know, you got to seize the opportunity while it's hot. And if you haven't already, consider forming a residence association. I've mentioned that a couple of times, residence associations. Really, it's, um, you know, some folks hear that and they think, oh, is that like a homeowner's association? Is this going to tell me I can't paint my house blue? You know, what, what does this mean? Uh, residence association is really just a voluntary 
uh, gathering of neighbors. Um, it's, it's nothing more complicated than that. Um, certainly, uh, you know, if you're going to go through and, and purchase uh, the community as a, a, a group, the Residents Association needs more than that. It needs bylaws, it needs officers, it needs to be a, a, real, a real organization. Um, but at its core, neighbors just need to be talking to neighbors when something this important is happening. Um, and if there's going to be a new landlord coming in, uh, it's better to have all the neighbors on the same page before the landlord takes over uh, so that if you, know, you and all your neighbors think the first thing we need this new landlord to do is to repave this road that's been so bad for so long, you know, that's something that the new landlord may very well want to know. Um, residence associations are not just a way to, um, you know, purchase the park. Uh, it can be a good opportunity to put together park cleanup days, to have a park barbecue, um, to create some, you know, mutual aids so that if someone's uh, having some health issues, you can help them with their rent, you know, so that your neighbors stay your neighbors. Um, it's just a good thing to commute to, uh, to, to bring a community together. Um, and mobile home parks are, are a great opportunity for that. You have your own space, but you live kind of close to other folks. So uh, it's, worth, it's worth talking to them, I think. Um, all right, the next is the uh, change of owner notice. Um, this notice uh, you know, is something that you do need to respond to, uh, certainly. The last one, that's all sort of voluntary. Uh, this one though, you need to figure out how you're gonna be paying your rent. Uh, make sure you got a good contact number, change, uh, you know, change the number in your phone so that in an emergency, you know who to contact. That's just a practical bit of advice there. Um, and like I said, uh, it might be a good opportunity to tell the new landlord what your community is expecting, what you need, and, you know, offer to chip in if there's something that your landlord wants you to do. Um, it's really just uh, about making sure that, you know, the park is on an upward trend, not a downward one. Um, and at this point, uh, you know, you may wish to, uh, to talk with the local government if, if it is an opportunity for you to give input in meetings and prevent the park from being closed if that's what the new owner has in mind. Uh, finally, if it is a closure notice, uh, that is uh, a serious matter indeed. Um, you'll need to plan what to do with your home. Um, you can uh, try to oppose uh, the park closing uh, and certainly, I think you should if that's what you, um, you know, if, 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 that's, if that's your goal is, is to prevent the park from closing, uh, you should let everyone in your local government know that. Uh, however, you know, there may not be an opportunity uh, for, uh, to prevent the park from closing. So you're, you're going to need to figure out what to do with the home. You can't rely on that. Um, when that notice is given, However, uh, the landowner must help uh, pay your moving expenses. So, you know, you have to take your home off that land. Uh, but the landlord, depending on where you live in the state, um, it's about $3,500 or it is $3,500 if you live up in uh, some parts of Northern Virginia. But for most of the state, it's about $2,500. That's not going to cover all the expenses for moving a home, but it'll, it'll help get you there. Um, uh, moving... Uh, the home may be expensive or impossible, depending on the home's age and condition, though, and that's just a sad, uh, sad truth of the matter. Um, I wanted to uh, share these resources with y'all, though. Um, this, these are four different organizations. Uh, well, more than that, really. Uh, but these are are some some places to turn when this sort of thing is happening, when when the park is being sold and. On the one hand, you're considering, you know, what might happen if, if the park closes, what might happen if we get a landlord who's gonna raise the rent astronomically. Uh, on the other hand, you've got a, a possibility that you can do some really cool things for your neighborhood. There's a possibility, you, now you know the landlord wants to sell, maybe he can sell to y'all. Um, there are some organizations here that might be able to help support you uh, in that effort. Um, the uh, the first one would be your local legal aid office. There's various offices all across the state for uh, legal aid. That is, you know, free legal help for folks uh, who qualify uh, in civil matters, not criminal, of course. Um, we have the number there for you to call them and, and reach your local branch. Um, Virginia Poverty Law Center, that's us. Uh, we're going to have our contact info on the last slide, but we help with a number of different uh, legal aid issues across the state. One of those 
is supporting uh, mobile home park tenants. And uh, if, in case it's not clear, it, it's really uh, important to me uh, that folks in these communities are, are looked after and uh, are treated right. And um, whether it is based on the, the park selling or not, um, you know, I'm interested in, in trying to make sure that, that uh, you know, y'all get the help you can, you, you deserve. Um, so our info is going to be on the last slide there. Uh, can't promise I can help in every situation, but I, I'd like to try. Um, Rock USA, I mentioned them earlier. They're that national organization that helps residents purchase their park. Uh, that's the phone number there. If you're interested in, in purchasing the park, uh, that's the number for them to provide technical assistance to do so. Uh, before you call that number, you're going to want to meet with your neighbors. You're going to want to uh, start an association and, uh, you know, get everyone on the same page. One person can't decide for the whole community that you want to go at this uh, new venture. Uh, you know, it, it takes a village. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when you're ready, Rock USA uh, may be able to help you figure out financing and all the rest of that. Uh, and then finally, MHCCV stands for the Manufactured Home Community Coalition of Virginia. I'm going to say that again because it's long and complicated. Manufactured Home Community Coalition of Virginia. That's a uh, Virginia nonprofit that advocates uh, for the enhancement of mobile home parks in Virginia. Uh, they advocate on behalf of uh, you know, residents of these communities and also uh, just in general uh, on reducing the stigma uh, associated with this form of housing and creating more opportunities for uh, these communities to thrive. Uh, they have a contact us uh, information link on their website that I included there. Feel free to reach out if, uh, if you ever, uh, you know, want some assistance in, uh, you know, forming a resident owned community. Uh, those are some good folks who may be able to put you in touch with the right people. Uh, although, you know, uh, the, the right people might be legal aid in Rock USA, but uh, it's, another, it's another route to try. Uh, so that about covers um, the, uh, the material that we had uh, prepared for you all today. Um, I hope that it was uh, educational and, and interesting to you. I'm going to open it for some uh, questions here in a moment, but before I do, Phil, is there anything that you wanted uh, to point out or add that uh, you know, I may have uh, I may have missed. Yeah, so um, not that you missed, but I think one of the things that um, that we mentioned that Joe mentioned is when there is a change in ownership, that's an opportunity for residents to get organized, to create a residents association. Um, one of the things, and we've been working um, trying to help folks in mobile home parks create residents associations for a number of years. Um, it is, there have been very, very few of them in Virginia. One of the, the challenges is that um, what we have found in the, the, um, the parks, the communities that end up reaching out to us, um, they're facing some sort of crisis. That's why they're reaching out to legal aid. That's why they're looking for help. Um, when a community is facing a crisis like that, um, there is more of motiva a motivation to try and understand really what do we have the power to do and, and how can we affect the situation. And in Virginia, the laws are not fantastic. They don't offer a whole lot of protections for residents. And so um, we have found that residents are much more open to the idea of forming a residence association when they have something you know, imminent that they uh, might have to, to band together to fight for. So he mentioned that um, when there's a change in ownership, there's often a lot of concern. People are confused. They don't know what this means. Um, we had a, a park in the Richmond area that it sold and the new ownership came in um, and offered a brand new lease to, to everybody. And the lease, the terms of the lease were not great. They were um, considerably worse than the conditions or the sort of the rules that people had been living under um, previously. And so people were concerned. Well, we um, were able to, they reached out to us. We were able to explain to them that on a one-by-one -one basis, there's very little that you can do. You don't have much bargaining power, but if you create a residence association, then you can actually try to negotiate um, a different lease terms with this landlord. 
So um, Joe also mentioned that the land that the the purchaser um, buys the park subject to the the leases that are already in place there. So if you've got six months, if people have six more months on their lease, well, that's six months they could ride out under their old lease, um, or they could offer to negotiate with the landlord um, a more uh, acceptable new lease that everybody could get behind. And that's what we helped a, a community in Richmond do um, a few years ago when the ownership had changed. Um, we helped them reform a residence association that had kind of gone dormant and negotiate much more favorable lease terms with the new landlord than they uh, otherwise, than they were offered and they otherwise could have gotten. And so um, that's the kind of thing that um, when there is, so a, a change in ownership is, is a very obvious opportunity where there's a lot of uncertainty and people are a little more um, open to the idea that, yeah, we really um, need to come together in order to, um, to protect our interests. Yeah, and, and to add to that, you know, from, uh, you know, our perspective as attorneys, um, there are some things that, you know, we may not be able to help our clients get in a, you know, one off matter. You know, if, if the client wants better lease terms, that's a really hard thing to negotiate for with just one person. Uh, but if the community comes together and they say, we all want better lease terms, uh, and the community is all willing to, uh, you know, stand together and, and raise in one voice these concerns, um, that, can, that can really make some changes that otherwise might not have been available. Um, in our particular instance that Phil was just referencing, it meant better lease terms, but it could also mean, uh, you know, potential park improvements or uh, other matters uh, where, you know, you don't want to send a letter to the landlord and say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm a problem tenant, I'm going to create issues for you, and I really want, you know, the pothole in front of my driveway to be fixed. Um, but if you talk with your neighbors and they also have potholes in front of their driveways and you send a letter to the landlord saying, Hey, you know, we are a group of, you know, your tenants and we are really concerned about these potholes. Uh, the landlord, uh, hopefully will take that well and, uh, understand that, you know, the whole community wants this improvement, uh, and won't, uh, you know, try to single out individuals who, uh, are, you know, seen as, as a squeaky wheel. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's multiple things that, that can be helped strategically, uh, from, uh, you know, neighbors talking to neighbors. I, I often present it in, you know, that sort of an informal way, but, uh, in, in a very formal way too, it can be, uh, strategically ad advantageous to, uh, work with your neighbors in, uh, getting the community for yourself that you want. Um, so I see that we had a couple questions in the chat. Um, before I uh, turn towards those, uh, are there any additional questions? Um, uh, folks can type them in or unmute themselves if they'd like. I have a few questions. Um, so, I'm just I'm new to the notices when a park is being sold, and I just wanted to sort of flush it out a little bit further. So, for for the offer and acceptance notice, at that point, does the does the current owner have to give you information on who the prospective buyer is and, and those types of details? No, I don't believe they do. Isn't that right, Joe? Right. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't believe that they have to give all of those details. Um, for examples of, of how these notices look and the information that's contained on them, uh, the uh, DHCD website uh, has all of them listed. So um, sometimes there's more details than you would expect given in some of these notices. Um, yeah. But um, I don't believe that that is a, a requirement offhand. But I, I assume one, one of the purposes is so that residents can potentially put in their own offer. I would imagine many residents also might be interested in speaking to the new prospective buyer to sort of feel them out. Is there, is there a mechanism or have you all had experience with being able to get in touch with the prospective buyer in advance of them accepting, of any acceptance? 
So um, I haven't personally, but I do know that um, there's a mobile home park up in Leesburg, Virginia, that was for sale recently. Um, and I know that uh, folks in that community wanted to put in an offer. Um, and uh, I believe it was disclosed to them who the potential purchaser was. And there was some discussion back and forth with the potential purchaser. Um, so on a case by case basis, that information may be available. Um, but I don't know uh, a method currently of, of uh, you know, forcing uh, that information to be available. But it's certainly worth seeking because you're exactly right. Um, you know, who the prospective purchaser is can, can tell a lot to the tenants. Um, and so, you know, getting that information, if available, uh, very well may be worth the effort. Okay, that's helpful. And then, um, so if a, if a owner does issue a listing notice, when they receive an offer, will they, they will not need to give an offer acceptance notice as well, or they would still have to notify everyone that an offer has been made? Wait, sorry. So which which one first? Uh, let me go back to my slide. So, so in, the, in the context where you have a seller, I'm sorry, an owner of a park, and they know that they are going to be selling it, and they issue to all of um, the, to everyone a listing notice. Once they receive an offer for the park, do they even though they've already issued a 90 day listing notice, do they also need to issue a 60 day offer acceptance notice to sort of put everyone on notice that we're at the stage of the process where there is an offer? Yeah, I believe that was the intent in, in uh, the drafting of this that, um, you know, the initial listing offer, uh, I mean, that's part of, you know, why it has this 90 day period um, you know, maybe 30 days in, there's a, an offer that the landlord intends to accept, um, and then they they give the offer acceptance notice. Um, I've seen some issues where folks are only giving one or the other. Um, I would want to look at that case by case, but I'm I'm pretty certain that um, you know the uh, the uh, the the finalization the the um, the completion of the, the, the sale is, is contingent on giving the offer acceptance notice, or at least ought to be. Uh, Phil, do you have any thoughts on that? No. So my recollection was that as we were discussing the need for or the desirability of having these notices, that we were there were basically two kinds of situations that we thought of. And one is where somebody decides to list the park for sale. And another one is where somebody just receives an offer out of the blue, uh, unsolicited. Um, and, uh, and I don't know, that it looks like that did not get written into the law. So from what I can tell, um, I think that the owner should um, issue a 60 day notice if they accept a, a, intend to accept um, an offer that they get even after they've given a 90 day notice when they listed it. So I think that's correct. Now, as one of the things that Joe mentioned, sort of um, the, um, the enforceability of these is really kind of an open question. And it's something that I know legal services in Northern Virginia has explored more than anybody else, I think. Um, and so um, they'll probably have good insights on that, Deep D and others. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think they should um, issue both notices. Um, mm -hmm. But um, then another question from, um, from the other participant, what if a contract is executed, but the sale does not go through? Um, I think that, I don't think that they would, I don't know. I, actually, I don't know if they, like, let's say they took down the listing because it was under contract, that sale did not go through. Would they have to issue a new listing notice when they relist it? Um, to be safe, I would think that they would have to. Um, even though the, you know, uh, the, I, I would think so because, um, you know, the, the terms that might, um, come out of any potential sales from a relisting might be different enough from the, you know, the contract that was entered into when it was first listed that, you know, the residents might have, uh, different ideas or, or more opportunity to compete with that. I don't know. 
This is all very new though. Um, so it's, uh, there's no case law on, um, on this duty to, to issue these notices or what happens if the notices are not issued. That's, this is all gonna be worked out. Yeah, and, and I would add to that, um, I'm actually just gonna go ahead. We, we know it's question and answer time uh, to, um, you know, this is, this is our contact info here. Um, if, uh, if anyone who's watching this is, you know, interested in a particular instance of this and, you know, wants us uh, to, you know, give, give some insight on how best to construct uh, this statute as applied to a particular instance, uh, reach out to us and, and if we're able, uh, you know, try and, try and help uh, uh, muddle through somehow. <laughs> like, like Phil said, the enforceability of this is a little bit of an, uh, an open question as far as what the remedy would be. Um, and so uh, it can be it can be difficult uh, with these notices, um, but they're they're plainly required. Um, and uh, you know, I, I I don't think that uh, only giving one relieves the duty of the other, um, or at least it's not written as such. Um, but yeah. Uh, any other questions? All right. Well, I think we're at our time. Um, I really appreciate those of us, or those of you, the, well, those of us who came tonight, um, those of you who who, uh, who showed up tonight, and anyone who's watching this, thank you for doing so. Our info is here on the screen right now. Um, please feel free to reach out uh, to myself. Um, I imagine Phil as well, but I can only speak for myself uh, and with any questions that you may have uh, about this. Um, like I said, I, I, I like to help when I can, and uh, if I can't, I'll, I'll try and steer you to someone who can. Phil? Yeah, no, thanks for joining us. This is um, especially this, um, the, the content that we've covered here. This is stuff that really is uh, important and very um, poorly understood by the folks who, um, who are most at risk of losing rights and losing, um, losing resources um, in this side of, sort of a situation. So the more widely we can get this information out there, the better. So yeah, thanks. So joining. Thank you very much. And um, we've been recording this and the uh, the video will be on YouTube, I believe. Uh, so feel free to, to share that with folks uh, now or later. Uh, thank you all so much and, and have a good night.